I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 25. Matthew, chapter 25 is our text, uh, and uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, uh, that's perfectly fine. If you're at our Parker campus, then uh, there's a table in the back. Just go back there and grab a Bible. If you're at our McCulloch campus or our Sweetwater campus, then in the seats around you, there are Bibles. And uh, go ahead and grab one. Turn to page 988. 988 is our text, our, our page number. You'll find the text there, be able to follow along. And whatever campus you're at, because we are one church in three locations, just know this, if you need a Bible, then take one with you. It is our gift to you because we want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Now, obviously, uh, this is kind of an exciting weekend. We're doing things a little bit differently. Uh, I am, uh, have a co-teacher this evening, or this weekend, I should say. And uh, this is Amber Smith. She is our serve director or the director of serve ministries. So she was the one in charge of Main Street this last week. She's the one in charge of serve our schools that happened earlier this month. Uh, she's running this Compassion Weekend uh, that we're having here. So if you've got the, if you go to the Compassion Experience, she's uh, coordinating all that. And so I've invited her to, to teach with us. Amber is also uh, has her uh, Master's of Divinity from Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And is married to our family pastor, Robert Smith. And she also happens to be my daughter, in case you're wondering. <laughs> so, uh, my oldest daughter. I have two of them. And uh, they're both wonderful, but uh, the other one can't teach with me tonight. So, anyway. <laughs> hey, uh, I cer certainly hope that you uh, get a chance to go through the Compassion Experience. It's out there. It's available. It's a treat to have it here. And so, uh, it, it will give you a glimpse into... Uh, ministry that is happening around the world and how people are actually living. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, take advantage of that. And then, of course, we just completed uh, Fright Night on Main Street, which really we had like a whole month of Halloween activities in Parker and Havasu, and we had over 200 volunteers. Uh, you guys donated tons of candy. It was cool. So thank you for serving. Uh, I'm excited about that. Now, uh, <laughs> those are the three people that served. They're all excited, too. <laughs> Or maybe they're the ones who didn't serve and all the rest of you are like, we're too tired to clap. <laughs> we were there for four hours. It was great, but I'm worn out. Hey, uh, we are continuing our, our series on the parables called Moral of the Story. Uh, we're looking at stories that Jesus told. And today we're looking at a parable that is a warning parable. It's about life and about judgment. Uh, now, you've already heard the passage, uh, Matthew 25. Uh, beginning at verse uh, 31 through for, verse 46. But uh, first thing I want you to know about this passage as we dive into it is that salvation is by grace, not good deeds. Salvation is by grace, not good deeds. And some of you are going, hey, you know the passage you just quoted? The passage that you shared? Sure sounded like if I'm a good person, then I get to go to heaven, and if I'm a bad person, I don't. Uh, and uh, this parable can be misunderstood. But that's not what it's about. And, and if we read the entire Bible, which, by the way, we want you to do, read all of it and uh, put it all together, you're going to understand Jesus was really clear. Because he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So we understand it is by placing our faith in Jesus that we have eternal life. It is not by doing good works. Uh, and and uh, the Apostle Paul echoed that. He said, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. We'll be forgiven. We'll have eternal life. He also said, it is... Uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. No one can boast. Hey, look, I, I just want you to be really clear on understanding this. Uh, we receive salvation by trusting Jesus, by coming to that place in our life where we believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world. We believe that he died on the cross to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead and we make a commitment to follow Jesus. We make that declaration of surrendering to Jesus Christ. Uh, so that's how uh, we receive salvation. It's by grace. It is not by works. We have to have that understanding so the rest of this parable makes sense. 
So the rest of the story makes sense. So how do we understand this parable? Jesus people care about others because Jesus cared about people. He cared about all people, not just the nice ones or the socially acceptable ones. He cared about everyone. He cared about those people that were labeled the outcast and the rejects of society. So in his time, the women, the children, the people that were sick and lame and crippled, those who had leprosy and the Gentiles, even when people like his disciples said, you shouldn't waste your time and energy with these people, Jesus said, no, let them come to me. He took the time to stop and have compassion on them and heal them and listen to them. And so Jesus cared also about those who hated him, those people that lied about him, betrayed him, the people that put him on the cross, the people that spat upon him. Jesus had compassion for those people and forgave them as well. So if you are a follower of Christ, Jesus expects you to care about others as well. So do you think about other people? And I'm not talking about what they're wearing or what they ate for lunch or what they're doing this weekend, but do you actually think about other people and what they may be going through and the struggles that they're having? And do you think about how you can love them and serve them? See, 1 John 3, 17 says, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? See, a lack of compassion should concern you. See, if you don't have compassion in your life, the way to build that is not just to do good deeds, but we have to make that surrender to Christ, like Patrick talked about earlier. We have to surrender to Christ because the love of Jesus in you will develop compassion in your heart. And see, I can talk from experience about this because um, I was convicted of a lack of compassion in my own life. Um, and from a young age, I've always had compassion for physical needs, um, caring about people that don't have much um, food or clothing. Um, but I did not have any compassion for people going through um, other kinds of struggles, emotional, spiritual struggles. My natural tendency is just to say, well, suck it up and deal with it. Um, but that's not the kind of attitude that Jesus has called me to. And so I had to um, surrender to him and ask him to develop compassion in my heart. And he has. Um, I still continually have to pray for that um, because it's not my natural tendency. But if you ask God, he will develop compassion in you. And so a lack of compassion should be concerning to us. It should be concerning because the, the parable is one of warning where Jesus talks about the sheep and the goats. And, uh, and I know that some of you are somewhat visual, so you might need some help. So if you're a follower of Jesus, then, then you might be kind of like this. But if you're not a follower of Jesus, then you're more like this. Now, it's what the end result's going to be uh, when you face judgment, okay? So, uh, and, and so we can laugh at that. Now, honestly, I'm not agrarian. I don't, I don't do, you know, animals and stuff like that. I'm not a farmer. I can't tell the difference between a sheep and a goat anyway. But, uh, but here's the deal. Uh, I'm not the one who has to figure out if you're a sheep or a goat. I, I'm really not. That, that is between you and God. And you can fool everybody else, but you can't fool God. Don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. And, and so as we, as we look at this story, you know uh, who you are. You know where you are in your journey spiritually. Uh, and can I just say this? If you know in your heart that you've never surrendered to Jesus and you know that you'd be in that group on the left, uh, then now is the time to trust Jesus. Now is the time to say, hey, I want to make this right. I want to surrender to God. I want to give him my life. But if you know in your heart that you're a sheep, okay, if you know in your heart that Jesus is your Savior and you belong to him and you're a follower, then uh, we need to talk about the expectations for Jesus' followers. 
The expectations for Jesus followers. Because if you break this parable down, that's what it boils down to. It, it clearly states the expectations for us. Okay? Jesus is very clear uh, about what he sees the sheep doing. What he sees those that are righteous doing. And, and so uh, this leads us to the moral of the story. The moral of the story is this. Jesus expects his followers to have compassion on others. So simple, so plain, so clear. Jesus expects me and you who call ourselves followers of Jesus, he expects us to have compassion on other people. Uh, so what I want to do is walk through this list in the passage. And, and, uh, and by the way, I use this list as kind of a checklist for compassion for the ministry of Calvary. And I want to challenge you, as we share about the ministry of Calvary, I want to challenge you to use it as a checklist for your life. And, and really to ask the Holy Spirit, am I a person of compassion? Am I a person that is demonstrating compassion in my life? So check your heart while we uh, share with you some of the things that, that Calvary is involved in. Because the list begins with, uh, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. Yeah, Calvary does a lot. Um, Calvary gives gift cards at every holidays. Um, we collect food and supplies for the food bank. Um, we do benevolence help for those in our community that are struggling and in need. Um, and we also have a partnership with Compassion International, which I am obviously very excited about. If you haven't gone through the Compassion experience, I highly encourage you to do that. Um, but we also, as Calvary as a whole, raised over $100,000 to build a compassion center in Honduras. And um, there are 175 children registered at that compassion center. Um, and those child packets are out in the lobby um, that you guys can sponsor tonight. Um, compassion is very open about all of their finances, if you have a concern about that. Um, and you can have a direct impact on a child's life, not only by feeding them and helping with medical um, bills, education, um, clothing, but you can write letters directly to the children and pray with them and share God's love with them. And we also are planning a trip to go visit this center and visit all of these 175 children. Um, so I would just encourage you guys, pray about sponsoring a child um, and pray about going on the trip to Honduras m March of 2020. Yeah, and I just uh, echo what Amber's saying. Uh, as a church, we only partner with ministries that are financially accountable. And uh, Compassion gets a, an A-plus on accountability uh, with the organization, same organization that uh, Billy Graham started to hold his ministry accountable. Uh, uh, checks in on compassion. So they're above board. They're trying to lead uh, children and their families to relationship with Jesus Christ. It is not about just giving them food or medical help or uh, education help. It is about holistic, beginning with spiritual development and all of the rest, trying to elevate families from poverty. And uh, by the way, and here, uh, this is just what I'm doing, so I'll throw it out there and you can do what God leads you to do. In terms of child sponsorship, that now, the center that we built eventually will have 300 children as part of it. We get the opportunity as a church to sponsor the first 175. So, so nobody else in, in all of America has a chance yet to sponsor these children at our center that you guys provided the funding for. And, uh, and so I'd encourage you to go out there and check it out. Uh, now, just my thing is I decided that uh, when, we were, when the girls were young, we, we sponsored two children of compassion because we had two kids. Now we're into the grandkids. So uh, we're doing, we have a child of compassion for uh, all of our grandchildren. And so it's, uh, it's one of those things. I'm, I'm beginning to think maybe I should sponsor more kids. Maybe God will provide more grandkids that way. But uh, he hasn't told me that's how it's going to work. So uh, I have two daughters. Uh, so uh, I, I'm not sure how that works. But I'm just saying that for, for us, it allows us to say, hey, to our grandkids, these are some of the kids that we're sponsoring on your behalf because we love you uh, and Jesus loves you, but Jesus also loves them and we're going to love them and encourage them. So I just want to throw out that challenge that uh, wherever you are in life, it is $38 a month. Uh, it's a tangible uh, commitment that you're making to change a child's life and their family's life uh, in the name of Jesus. Because 
I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. And then Jesus says, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. And uh, you guys know this, besides providing water and coffee for you guys on the weekends, uh, we, uh, uh, we also are invested in a ministry in Mozambique uh, about drilling freshwater wells. Uh, I, was, I was just in Mozambique last month. Well, now it's two months ago because now we're in November. But uh, in, in September, I was there. I got to see a lot of the well sites since I've been there. They've drilled uh, about four more. We're over 40 freshwater wells in villages uh, all throughout the country of Mozambique. And they're using those as opportunities to, to preach, to start churches, to do evangelism. And, uh, and it's happening uh, nonstop because those wells are a reminder to people that God loves them. In fact, in the concrete on the wells, they actually put God loves you. In, in their language. And so uh, people are reminded this is why the well is here and it's for everybody, but the purpose is to lead them to that life-changing relationship with Jesus. And so uh, each well, by the way, costs about $3,000. And Calvary, through the, your guys' generosity over the last three years, has provided over f- funding for over 40 wells. Now, uh, yeah, I think that's cool. I think that's cool. Now, here's the, here's the really wild thing. Each well uh, provides water for about 750 to 1,000 people. So right now, minimum, every single day in Mozambique, there are 30,000 people drinking water that you have provided. It's clean, it's fresh, and it's, and it's healthy. Yeah, it, it is life-changing. It is life-changing. So uh, I just, I just want to commend you for that. So Jesus said, I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink, and... A stranger who is welcome. Now, this, um, back in Jesus' day, was talking about hospitality. So culturally, when people traveled, there weren't hotels like we have now. And so they would go and stay in people's homes. So it was very important for you to be hospitable and invite people into your home. We don't do that, but we still have the importance of being hospitable towards others. Um, But as Calvary, we have a ministry to the homeless. And our ultimate goal is to prevent homelessness and get people off the streets into home. And so, but we also provide immediate needs like sleeping bags, food, clothing, backpacks, um, and water as well. Yeah. And then Jesus said, I was sick and in prison and you visited me. Uh, We've got a wonderful volunteer team of hospital chaplains that uh, if you're in the hospital, they're going to come and check on you. If you're homebound or if you're on hospice, they're caring for you. Uh, the best way to get cared for, though, is if you plug into a life group. Because if you're in a life group and you get sick, then the hospital has to, like, give warnings about how many visitors you can have at a time. Uh, I've, I've gone to visit people. And it's like, I can't get in the room. Can you just let them know I was here? Uh, because their life group is caring for them. And then we've also got a ministry of Celebrate Recovery on the inside in the local jail, where every uh, week they are there teaching people about recovery and the opportunity they have to give their lives to Jesus Christ. There's a lot of things going on. And then, of course, Jesus said, I was naked and you clothed me. We have a ministry here called Heart to Heart, and it's part of the women's ministry. Um, And what it does is it uh, gives out bags to children um, that have been put into the foster care system. These are age and gender appropriate bags filled with clothing, hygiene products, and other things um, just to care for the kids that have been taken out of their home and put into a foster family. Um, And then also we have our Christmas backpacks, which is actually coming up in two weeks. So you can take one of those, fill it, um, and give a gift at Christmas to a child all over because we send them all over the world. Um, hey, I just got to ask you this. Did you guys know all this? Yeah. Okay, some of you did. How many of you heard about a, new, a ministry t- uh, today that you've not heard about us doing before? A lot of hands are going up. See, that, that is really cool. See, uh, uh, there's so much going on. We didn't even touch on all of it because we don't have time to do that. Plus, I want you to hear this. this uh, I, I just got this, this number Friday. In the last 12 months, Calvary, as a church, has given over $750,000 to mission causes outside of ourselves. $750,000, people. You, you guys have give, gave away three quarters of a million dollars to bless people all over the world in Jesus' name, beginning right here in our communities of Parker and Havasu. I think that's amazing. And so we've, we've shared a lot of information about what Calvary does to show compassion to people. 
because our mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. Okay, that's what we're doing. That's why we're doing this. But what about you? Let's get personal for a moment because this parable is personable. It's not just about the groups, although he divides the nations. It's really about the people. And each one of us is going to stand before the king and give an account. So Jesus expects his followers to have compassion on others. So we want to close by asking two questions. And, and these are really questions I hope you wrestle with way beyond uh, today. I hope, I hope these are questions that you'll write down and you'll go back and as a family you'll talk about them, as a couple you'll talk about them, as an individual you'll meditate on them and say, God, how am I doing? So first question. How do you see people? Um, this is like the haunting question of the goats in verse 44 because they said, Lord, when did we see you? So how do you see people? Do you see people the way that Jesus sees people? Do you see people that are created in the image of God, that are loved by God, that are God's children? Um, how do you respond to a homeless person asking for help or someone holding a sign on the corner of the street? Do you have judgmental thoughts towards them and think that they're trying to scam you? Or do you see an opportunity to feed Jesus? Um, and I'm not saying that you have to give them money. I don't ever typically do that. But you can, you know, stop at In-N-Out and get them a burger and fries or go into the grocery store and get them some food. Or a really great thing to do um, if you're in a hurry is have snacks in your car, granola bars, protein bars, water, um, and just have, serve them. Um, what about people with different political viewpoints than you? Do you despise them and think they're just a bunch of idiots? Um, or do you choose to love them and put being a child of God as more important than the label on your voter ID card? What about your in-laws or some other annoying family member? Do you <laughs> ostracize them and make them an outcast from your family? Or do you choose to be hospitable and invite them into your life? And for some of you, that may mean loving your enemy. But how do you see people? How do you see your spouse, your kids, your family, your friends, coworkers, strangers, people that are just different than you? See, do you see people as a nuisance or do you see people as God's children? Are, do you get aggravated and angry at people or do you choose to love them? Do you see people as a waste of time and money or as an opportunity to serve? Are you so distracted by your own priorities that you don't take time for people or is God calling you to care about people and to give them hope? So... How do you see people? Yeah, I like that. Are people obstacles or opportunities? Yeah. Because they're one, they're, you're going to see them one way or the other. And then second question, does your life reveal a life-changing relationship with Jesus? Now, uh, it, that, that's really easy to say, well, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. I call myself a Christian. I, I identify as a Christian. I, I label myself. But, but does your life show it? Uh, See, the, the parable to me that, that Jesus told that we're talking about was one not of proclamation, but of action. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. What matters is what does your life reveal? So do you have compassion for other people? And, and does anybody see it? You know, if you, if you took a poll of your friends, how, how would they vote, sheep or goat? Not based on what you say, but based on what you do. I'm not sure you want to do that because you probably still want friends. But, uh, but really, seriously, how, how would other people see you? And, and more importantly, really, honestly, how does Jesus see you? What does he think about your actions? Because this is about life change. This is about loving Jesus and loving others. This is about recognizing your blessings and, and realizing how blessed you are and seeing the needs of others and saying, hey, I can, I can help. I can do something. Uh, it's all, by the way, it's always easier to justify why you can't do something than it is to actually do something. And this is a parable of action. See, ultimately, this is about obeying Jesus. 
because this, this parable is a warning to a life of selfishness. You guys do see that, right? You can't call yourself God's people and be selfish. Jesus was talking to a bunch of people who considered themselves chosen people and thought that they had God's favor, and he's rebuking them for a life of selfishness even while they're calling themselves God's people. And so this echoes a, a blunt statement that Jesus recorded uh, in Luke chapter 6. Because Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I tell you? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I tell you? So let's obey Jesus. Let's meet his expectations. Let's choose to be people of compassion. Uh, here's the thing. I can't choose for you. I, in fact, I can't choose for anyone but myself. So I pray that you choose to be someone who puts others' needs ahead of your own. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you put our needs ahead of anything else when you sent Jesus into this world to suffer and die for our sins, our rebellion, our defiance, our selfishness. You've, you paid for all of our sins, and so we're not trying to be people of compassion so that you will love us or so that you will save us. We want to be people of compassion because of your great compassion for us, your mercy that was demonstrated in Jesus and right now, you're, as your spirit moves in this room, as you apply the words of Jesus to our hearts, God, help us to see our selfishness for what it is. Every one of us is predisposed towards, towards just being selfish. And, and God, help us to see that. Help us to repent of that. And help us to choose to see people through Jesus' eyes, whether they're hungry or thirsty, or whether they're just simply lonely or forgotten or depressed are struggling and help us to be those hands and feet those words of Jesus in their lives so that we can hear well done good and faithful servants in Jesus name amen